man to get us online. I always forget to do that. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, stop. Anything out. Thank you very much. Welcome to those joining online. Um, first, we have the confirmation of our minutes from our last meeting of the 19th of April. Somebody who was there, which should confirm that true and correct. Thank you, Tamer. Seconded, Martin. Any discussion on that basis? All those in favour? Um, just double check, was I there? No. No, no I can't oh, You withdraw your not? I will. So, so move Tamer, seconded, Sarah. Thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Against, that's carried. A reminder to councillors to make sure that you are up to date with your declarations of interest and you stand back from any decisions in which you may have a real or perceived conflict of interest and to regularly update your members register. We now have uh, time for public forum and first public forum speaker, Christine Rapp. Welcome, Christine. The floor is yours. You have five minutes, Christine. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Ladies and gentlemen, I only need this one to make a presentation. Let's pick up my thing and go over and share. It's on rhyme. And there may be a few flaws. Okay. It came to our attention that you have every intention to clear fell amenity trees from the half mile plantation. To be heard was no easy solution. It was to be done without consultation. No research, no planning, and no preparation. We read it on Facey. I think her name may be Macy. What does one do round here to inject some fun, a little Christmas cheer? Not new to decoration, put our hands up in declaration. We'll put some thought in that. Create a fabulous rock art track. With absolutely no time to waste, we turned to Facebook, show our distaste. Collectively, we made a decision. Let's stand together and start a petition. Under no illusion as to a practical solution, we only want what we already have. But really, 14 hectares, is that so bad? Think now how you'd feel as a wee girl or boy when someone you trusted came along, took your bestest toy. Promises of plantings, what a waste. An afterthought, an 11th air plan and made in your haste. Pop is planned for shelter, oh my, if they survive, pigs might fly. Twiggy and spindly, no shelter with these, will struggle enough to subdue southerly breeze. We present this petition, and I'd like you to pass that down, please, to give you an indication Nearly 500 people shown support in kind, but we know it's unlikely to change your mind. We have 200 plus cutouts and rocks painted in all their glory, patient waiting excitedly as well to continue their story. The beautiful tracks where they used to lay to be brutally taken, yes, bulldozed away. Earth's only toxicity does not come from the land. Sadly, it's introduced from that of our hand. Four lettered geckos, fantails too. You just might walk through, oh dear, a contractor's poo. <laughs> Goodbye from me, Christine Sylvia Ridd. For this moment, I'm off the grid, looking forward to my next fixation, contemplating, mmm, boot hill plantation. Almost none of you here walk the trails we hear and never know what you've missed. So it gives us much pleasure to give to you all this. And it reads, 
to be well in pine free before 2323. Good luck to you, CODC. It's me. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Any questions, councillors? Yeah, I had one actually. Christine, yeah. I just wondered. I did go up the trail with my kids and enjoyed the stones. And I yeah. wondered if you had kept the stones and intend to put them somewhere else or the same place. Or I have gifted them. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. I've gifted some to some special people. If you know, it, you're special. Um, that is our plan for as long as our health holds up and as long as I'm fit and able. And I work on that every day, as you know, because I do a lot of walking <laughs> and I see a lot of things around about. Thank and you. this is what pushed me to do what it did. They were fantastic. Thank you, Lynn, mate. We had some wonderful feedback. Thanks, Christine. Next speaker, Ken Churchill. <clears throat> Christine, it's a hard act to follow, mate. Yeah. I uh, called my talk this morning the Half Mile Reserve, reconnecting with the community. Kiora, I don't wish to relitigate the whole issue, but one should always look in the rear vision mirror before overtaking. The Half Mile debacle started for us on the 5th of October 21, with only three working days' notice. The Council put out a press release on that day, then quickly altered their stance on the 7th due to pushback from the community. Then on the 9th of November, and I quote, the Parks and Reserve Manager said, the existing pine trees were not planted, but most likely self-seen from nearby trees over the past 34 years. So much for council research. Ongoing, an executive member of staff has said on numerous occasions that no community consultation was required as it was just an operational requirement. So thousands of dollars and hundreds of million hours later, here we are on the eve of destruction. For those of us that were adamant about retention, a great compromise all but came to fruition. A stage removal replant. Well, we all know how that turned out. But I'd like to acknowledge the VCB and those six councillors with that, with that, who had a little more wisdom and foresight. Just imagine an existing shelter belt, irrigation free to protect the new indigenous plantings while they get started. Recently, we were informed that they will plant Lombardy poplars as shelter and then prune them and chop them down sometime later. Still no finite water source. People often ask why there was no staging, and I simply answer, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Yesterday's ODT, the Community Experience Executive, calls for input for a plan to replant, and cites a great response, but still no finite water source mentioned. So is there a final landscape plan? or is calling for community input at present just lip service or another tick box? Phil Murray of the CW probably said it best in a newsroom piece with reference to the council at an ORC meeting in Cromwell, and he said, this is not how you go about it. In that vein, ringing up and texting a neighbour well into the night about a landscape plan is not the best way of getting the locals on board, or a council staff member at a meeting going off at you just because of the production of a photo of Slash at Grover Hill. So when Councillor McPherson says there's more than a gap between the local community and the council, he's so on the money when he described it as a chasm. So going forward, it's incumbent on the council to bridge that chasm. We're all still here. And to finish, the lyrics from Phil Coulter's song, The Town I Love So Well, for what's done is done, and what's won is won, and what's lost is lost and gone forever. And Judge Dickey recently, when the Auckland Council were away with over getting rid of trees, said the environmental effects of the loss of the trees were serious as the qualities it provided 
could not easily be replicated and to destroy such a tree was to remove its benefits from the community for a generation at least. Cheers, happy chainsawing. Chris Winter. Questions? Oh, sorry, good point. Any, any questions, councillors? No, thank you. Chris Winter. Um, can I just have the people from the community who've come to support stand up, please? So you can all see. Um, you were all sent a letter yesterday. Did you who who received it? Well, yeah. You put it up. Yeah. You don't need any extra copies. No. Okay. Thank you for letting me come to speak today. My here presence today is to draw our attention to the legal uh, letter that has been recently sent to you all, dating the uh, unlawful proposed felling of the trees at the Half Mile Reserve. It's with great sadness and um, disappointment that we've reached this point. And the Half Mile Reserve Community Group has been left with no other options, despite many volunteer hours and discussing with uh, staff providing information over the last 18 months. The two main points I wanted to get across to you in the letter are that the Council has a duty under the Reserves Management Act 1977 to have a Reserves Management Plan in place, which you have failed to do. It's, it's, it's part of your work. Also under section 42, three, the Reserves Management Act clearly says that the Council may not authorise the removal of trees in advance of finalising a restoration plan, which they have clearly done. This is law. The Council was therefore in breach of its statutory obligations under the Reserves Management Act 1977. We request that the Council meets its duty to prepare a Reserves Management Plan together with a reserves restoration plan in consultation with the community before the issue of removal of trees on the half mile reserve is revisited. Therefore, we anticipate confirmation from the council that the removal of these trees in the reserve will be suspended by 5 p.m. today until such time as these requirements under the law are met. Otherwise, further legal action will be taken. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, councillors? Thank you. Next, we have Rachel Baxter from Pahasa. Good morning. Your direction. Uh, I'm Rachel Baxter, and I've been invited to tell you a bit about the organisation that I work for, uh, which is High High Art and Natural Heritage Trust, an organisation founded formally back in 2017, but with its origins going back to 2011. Roger Brown, a name familiar to you all, gathered a small group of volunteers to share space in the native plant nursery run by Doc and to operate the sideline community nursery. In 2015, Doc withdrew from the nursery completely and Bill Nagel stepped in to rebuild the operation with the aim to provide native plants to community groups to plant on public land. Support came from various places throughout Central Otago, including practical advice and guidance from Kakapano and Monica and the Whakatapu Reforestation Trust, flourishing sister organisations and both fantastic examples of how community nurseries can thrive. We have come to a management agreement with DOC and have use of their premises, a tunnel house and hiding off area, and the land they are on. We've had, uh, expanded to include extensions, to the nursery and have a brand new shed to give us all weather, an all weather sheltered area to work from and socialise in on what is a very exposed site. At the core of our existence are our volunteers, the five dedicated trustees and the numerous weekly volunteers that assist in propagation activities fundamental to meeting our vision, which is to see our communities thriving with landscapes and corridors rich in habitats of indigenous flora and fauna. The Trust employs two staff members for 10 hours a week to assist the vision in a practical way. Dana, the nursery manager, has created a nursery of locally eco-sourced seeds and plants, and myself as project coordinator to foster partnerships and to share our vision and to assist with learning and participation. To this end, we have developed several long-standing relationships with a small number of community groups to plant on public land. 
This involvement can include species advice for sites, planning and permissions, funding of the plants and occasionally consumables like rabbit protection, and on the day guidance if want wanted. We have semi regular groups coming to us for one off projects over the years. We have also been involved with most of the local schools from nursery visits, classroom presentations to planting days. A few private landholders have also undertaken longer term native planting projects with assistance from us. We are four years into our own revegetation project out at Blacktop Hill Conservation Area. It is a dry land site and has no supplementary irrigation. This project is regularly monitored and from it and our other group's projects, we're gaining good knowledge on the best species for the different environments Central Otago has. The challenges have been many and a lot overcome. The following are five current issues and some are ongoing. Number one, public ignorance of our native species. Central Otago has the dubious honour of having lost your native vegetation and having the least amount of protected areas than any other district in New Zealand. This leads to a great lack of knowledge in our special flora and their role in our indigenous biodiversity, including unfortunately within our own council, which should be out there championing our world of difference. Our extreme climate has led to plant and animal specialisation over many thousands of years, and therefore our plants are different to most other places. They can be very small, and our biggest species will never obtain the height of their exotic tree counterparts, and also most are slow growing. Two. We're seeing future demand, creating demand, and then meeting that demand. Some plants take two years just to germinate. It can be a long journey to planting out stage. Three, we are now trying to plant native plants into what is an essentially an exotic landscape. Establishment in our extreme environment is tough enough, but we have the further challenge of many introduced plants that have become weeds, out competing our native species, and of course, there are the introduced browse and mammals. These all add complexity and cost to any planting project undertaken in Central. Four, maintenance of plantings, both our revegetation project and those of other community groups, is beginning to become an issue. As more plants go in, more first years support is needed. A few solutions are being sought and includes being a conduit for Fulton Hogan and the community giving scheme and looking at funding options ourselves. And number five, being financially viable. The trust would not have been able to get to where we are today without paid staff. We currently have a friend scheme which sees 20 local businesses donating annually to cover just under two thirds of the wages. The rent is sourced from grants of which the ORC has been a fantastic trust supporter. As it stands currently, the paid hours are not enough to cover current demands, let alone future need. Our interactions with the council have been many and varied over the years, and I think it is fair to say somewhat disheartening at times. A lot of time, such a valuable commodity, and thought has gone into all of our submissions and proposals, but I think the tide is slowly turning, but time will tell. To finish, we would love to host you at our nursery sometime and show you, show you one of the two projects we are involved in. And as I am now out of time, please feel free to ask me any questions especially about occasions when we've come together and where we think our work is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Well timed. Um, <laughs> can I ask the, the, the business funding, what's that, how much is that a year? Uh, so um, we have <laughs> most of the 20 businesses support $1,000 a year, but because that is unachievable for smaller businesses who do want to support us, we've broken it down into um, a half share kind of, or even share slices of pie and cooler. Yeah. Do you have a similar scheme just for individuals or families who want to be supportive at a lower rate? No, we, we've sort of worked on a, we've just developed a, a plant gifting scheme where people can donate a plant to one of the various local projects that we've got. We've got Clyde School, we've got the Lower Manaburn Reserve, we've got our own plant here at Flat Top Hill, and we've got um, KACB as our um, planting projects that you can support by the individual donations. And how would people access it? Is there a Facebook page or? Um, I actually, it is quite new, so I don't know whether it is on our Facebook page, but um, we do have a link. Cool. Yeah. I've so encouraged right. councillors to go and have a look at the mm -hmm. planting. It's great. Mm -hmm. We'd love to have a look at Flat Top Hill or some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would love to get you out there because, I mean, the VCP Community Board actually in 2021 granted us some money to extend the nursery. So, you know, it'd be nice to show you what you funded. Thanks. So, questions from Martin, then Stu. 
No? No, 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 sorry, I thought it was sorry, I, I think it's amazing that sort of work you're doing, and I was at a drop in centre in Ranfurly on Monday, and Tiaki Mini at Toto are pretty much exactly the same. Um, and they have actually repurposed the old school building in Hatera. Um, We have a debate with the council and the staff are working through it as whether the water they can use for the building that was there can be used for irrigation to propagate the plants they have for the Tiaki planting, and they'll come to council for various discussions. So I think. Well done and good on you. As a farmer, well, and their group, you talk about the native plants and the plantings. That river in the Tiger River is full of willow trees, it's full of deer, it's full of geese, it's full of possums. Everyone's got that same problem, and, and, and it will be a problem no matter where. And we're the same as farmers. We've got so many native species on our hill country. It's amazing. They're all, and most farms are protecting them a lot. So I do sympathise. It's very hard to get them going again. Um, but, you know, when you get noxious pests and plants, they are also pretty lethal when it comes to native species and so you're talking about wild animals, rabbits, deer and pigs. Phenomenal damage they do to the native environment. So uh, well done for the work and trying to get those things going. And, and I know in the mini a really good group of volunteers are doing a wonderful job, so well done. Yeah. Any other questions? Great, thanks very much Rachel. All right, thank you. That is the end of public forum for today. So moving us back to our agenda, we now come to 2352, noting there's no apologies today. And that's the annual plan submitters that wish to be heard. And so I welcome, firstly, Carmen Batchelor. And Carmen, you've got five minutes as well. Welcome. Good to see you there. Thank you. Um, I'm Bachelor Ahoy. Um, I'm the privilege of being um, the Director of Family West Presbyterian Support Otago, supporting a team who live and move across our district. Just want to thank you, Worship, and the attending councillors for the opportunity to speak to this incredibly important, vital issue that impacts on the most vulnerable ratepayers across the district. Um, I'm going to take my submission as lead. And um, I really want to highlight the key points um, that I've made in that submission and also talk about the very real impact that this is having across the wider community. I know everyone at this table, you will have your own children, grandchildren, parents, where our whole world has changed because of the last three years of COVID impact, the cost of living crisis, 7.2% um, increase in food prices, petrol, and the significant hardship that is occurring across our entire country and across our district. Um, I'm a southern girl. I grew up in Invercargill. I have the wonderful privilege of being a Southlander in Samoa. Um, and what's happening in our community is quite worrying in terms of what we're seeing for ratepayers. So I've made specific submissions around wanting to partner with the council about how we actually reduce financial hardship for ratepayers who are struggling. And I just want to say that everyone across the community is struggling and across the wider social sector. So what we're actually seeing is often a myth or narrative that it is only those that are currently on main benefits or what we'll call non-beneficiary assistance. The reality is the working poor are struggling. Middle class New Zealanders, we're seeing significant numbers of clients as we have for three years while working who cannot afford to meet basic needs. Why I've honed in on rates relief is I believe you have an opportunity to actually make a difference. Some of those are quite simple things like having on your council website, if you are financially struggling, please ring these agencies for help. We are aware of a number of people across the district who are behind, um, currently in arrears, struggling. If you get in early, you actually have the opportunity to engage with financial mentors, Cultural Targo Budget Advisory and ourselves as family groups to actually help people to catch up and have a very clear plan. So we really welcome that opportunity and we do believe it aligns with the commitment about social wellbeing for the community. We'd also like you to have a look at and review your income eligibility table. It's significantly um, outdated with, you know, if you take into account CPI, um, inflation and also looking at, say, community service cards rates and factoring on cost of living prices. So I think there's a really good opportunity there. Fully aware that obviously the proposed 10.45% rates increase that you have will also have another significant impact. Um, so what we are asking really is for that opportunity to partner with the wider social sector, the security from Otago and others, to actually make a real tangible difference. 
what does this actually look like? What's the base of this? So talking to the team, um, I can give you a current example of an uh, elderly couple on the Rand Fairly Money Total, who based on your current income eligibility calculator get a $200 rebate. However, they do not have enough money to survive and they're currently heating one room because they cannot afford with war um, and they're not alone in that. So we are seeing this being replicated across all of Southern. People who are making choices between cutting back on food, so nutrition is an aspect, and this is for our older people, really concerned about our over 65s, um, but also families. We also have families who are separating because of the stresses, but they can't afford to actually leave the property because they can't afford to buy another house and they actually can't afford to buy, um, you know, go into rentals as well. That has a significant impact on the age of the care space. So obviously you have rate payers who are landlords, who again are having to lift the rents just to be able to make it, which then means people don't have the money to pay. And so for us, that has a real impact in the age residential care space because we're trying to bring in international nurses who can't afford to stay and pay those rates at the time. And many of you will know, um, you know, so it has a huge impact on businesses as well. So I really want to, um, yeah, really for me, it is about actually review those rates practical, tangible things that we can do. There are a number of supports that we can put in place in the community. So we are very fortunate to have Central Arts Trust assist us with the heating fund, which makes a practical difference for those that are struggling with you know, energy hardship. We also have energy hardship programs in terms of are you on the best power plan, but I believe there's a really wonderful opportunity to work in here with council. I, I just want, um, it's really disheartening um, to see the level of need for people that we have never seen before, because often there is that perception that social services are only dealing with those on benefits. And across the district, and even included, our food bank as an example, we've seen a 35% increase month on month. Um, we cannot keep up with the demand, and these are predominantly working people. So I just really want to say, in your roles as councillors, here is an opportunity. What is your legacy? What is the legacy that you want to leave for your children, grandchildren, our parents, and other generations who are struggling? And this is a very practical, tangible way that we can do this. And I see this as the start of the conversation. I'm really happy to continue that. And I was really heartened to see that you put in about actually referring this issue to your the people that are in charge of the whole rate side. We welcome those conversations. Um, I really want to end on there's two quotes. One is the well-known Māori um, proverb, which is he ahote manui o te o, what is the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata, it is people. And Mother Teresa, a society can be judged by how it treats their children and their older people. So I'm going to thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Good and thank you for your really well thought through submission. It was Great to receive it and really useful to have you coming back at that because this is crucially important stuff. And I think the way you've offered practical advice to assist rather than just saying not good enough mm -hmm. is greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Councillors, questions? Um, um, yeah, I totally agree with on the media total. We are that place and for people to go to the doctor if they can't get the service of Renfrew, they've got to go to Clyde or Dunedin and they're isolated so their food bills dear out there yeah. and there's a there's a, a a race not a race there's a real need for elderly people's housing and our flats and there's a waiting list on them out there um, and i guess that's our whole bed is to make sure we look and as mike down and you summed it up who was a counselor two times before myself as we look after a young and old and the rest will look after themselves and i guess our challenge here and then impending threatening court action to go look at, you know some things we've got to bounce it off in a community and we have to do that every decision we make. So thank you for your help and your advice. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for highlighting the housing. Like I wanted to make that link as well, but like rates is just an issue, but it's on a continuum of you've got an opportunity here as part of a regional housing strategy. And I know as social services, we're really keen to progress that because obviously we all want to keep people in safe, warm, dry, affordable housing. And actually rates and staying on top of that as part of that because we don't then want to see people displaced because it, certainly what we're seeing in other parts of our district in Dunedin is an increase in mortgage sales. Mm -hmm. So if we can actually get on top of this now. In our community building hospital when we're home out of its own money even yes. through funds for that purpose and it served us magnificently well and the council contributed and I think 
I think it was the price of a taxi fare from Dunedin Airport to the Octagon gave the community a hospital, retirement home and a medical centre, so we're trying to. Yes. Okay. Other questions, councillors? Excellent. Thank you very much, Carmen. Greatly appreciate it. just getting a presentation for the next speaker organised, but while that's happening, Matt Stoll, welcome, Matthew. Good to see you. Come on up. Oh, there we go. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you. Um, this submission comes from my concern about the adequacy of the annual plan and long term planning. I'm an inquisitive and inquiring thinker and always forward looking. Today, I'd like to share some information with you that is employing my concern of our futures and especially of our future generations. This great acceleration is a dramatic and continuous, roughly simultaneous review across a range of measures of human activity and consequently across Earth systems trends, which clearly show the following of GDP as an inadequate measure of our human progress. I also will attempt to introduce some new systems working for working within planetary boundaries, a framework for a safe operating space for New Zealand. Cause and effect largely externalised in our current economic practice. Here is a selection of six graphs that follow key human activity trends covering population, GDP, primary energy use, water use, consumption. Sorry, what is the RICS? I'm not familiar. Oh, that's uh, Russia, Brazil, South and oh. Africa. Gotcha. Thank you. China. Yeah. And here we have a selection of um, of graphs showing the effects on of human activity on some of the key Earth systems. So this is carbon dioxide, methane, surface temperature, and terrestrial biosphere degradation. We are an overshoot of our planetary boundaries. There are planetary and natural resource limits to growth. In New Zealand, we reached Earth overshoot on the 19th of April this year. This comes after a huge jump from the 15th of May in 2020 to the 19th of April. So the trend is clearly in the wrong direction. What is central Otago's care and capacity? To plan ahead, we need to know our planetary limits and natural resource budgets. Our economic system is embodied and embedded in the material world. So all economic activity involves energy use, use of the land, of atmosphere, water, as well as other physical resources. Inevitably, this has a variety of disruptive impacts on plants, animals, and biosphere. Economists describe this disruptive impact as externalities, as if they are an unusual special case, when in fact, ecological disruption is the result of industrial economic activities. The scale of these impacts are now a real threat to life on the planet. Personally, I've tried to understand the economics of growth on a finite planet. It doesn't reconcile with a right relationship 
and good stewardship of our material world. Planetary boundaries are a framework to describe limits to the impacts of human activities on the Earth system. Beyond these limits, the environment may not be able to self-regulate anymore. The planetary boundaries framework defines a safe operating space for humanity based on the intrinsic biophysical processes that regulate the stability of the Earth's system. The doubling effect is well at work at Central Otago. I've lived here for over 40 years in a range of rewarding careers. Through these different lenses, I've observed and experienced a staggering degree of land conversion across the region. This is at considerable cost to the biological health and function of our life support system. We have experienced significant growth as a region, and still we seek more. This report was commissioned by the Ministry of Environment, quantifies five of the nine planetary boundaries relevant to New Zealand. New Zealand's contribution to boundary transgressions. This follows the maximum. You can't manage what you can't measure. Like all developed nations, New Zealand exceeds its fair share of safe operating space related to climate, biodiversity, nutrient use, and deforestation. Hey Matt, that's the five minutes. Are you close? Are there some points? I'm just not sure how far you want to go. Are there some highlights that you want to hit? If I give you another minute? No, I'll just talk quick. Well, um, yeah, OK, thank you. Um, the question that I've got, and I hear what you're saying, um, please feel free, feel free to stay, so I'd love to whatever. Well, I haven't finished one. Well, there's an opportunity to get your point across more for answering questions. In a, in a place like Central Otago, where a lot of people want to come to, how does the council stop the growth because my concern is if we don't accommodate the people who are wanting to come from other places. I mean, I know this is an interplanetary thing, but we're just the, not interplanetary. It's a whole planetary thing. We're, we're, we're a council over a small part of that planet. Yeah, what do we do about our very fear? Look what Otago regions, level of biosphere and techness. We've got some of the lowest in New Zealand. Which we're very grateful in size too. Yeah. That's the same point she was making, right? Yeah. Yeah. Say that again. That graph is a is a measure of can explain it of biodiversity intactness. So it's basically it's a level of richness and abundance of our natural biodiversity. So 100 percent is intact. 28 percent is where we're sitting. Zero is no intactness. And we're at 28 percent. Yeah. So how much have we shifted in the last 10 years? Well, I. I've got some. I can't. So that, that's a, that's basically a measure of harmony with nature and the environment, people, animals. It's the level of, of the human impact on our ecological plants. So that would reflect the amount of area that's been converted into a monoculture, such as grasslands or here yes. say, logging pines, yeah. or, or non-logging pines for that. Yeah, it's the level of land conversion from its indigenous state. So we're right up there with Canterbury. Other places from its indigenous state to part in an intensification of pasture. And Basically, yeah, I mean, from my experience, I've lived it where I've lived for 16 years. Now, when I first moved there, there was virtually no improved pasture. So it was certainly a mix of introduced plants, but there was also exotic grasses. And in that time, I would say the level of irrigation has changed probably 40%. And I would say there's virtually 90% of that land is now being cultivated. And in some cases, it gets cultivated for winter grazing up to three times in the month season. So that's the level of this, you know, disturbance. So how much of a part of that, I totally agree, has come down to the use of intensified irrigation as part of our rules, where the old day, if it a wild flood would last you 20 or 30 acres, and that would be the only thing. And then along came the rules where everyone had to put a specialist irrigation and the water went three times as far. And actually the cost of that 
the simple answer to that is that we externalise the effects. So we look at wanting to grow and improve pasture, and we look at the benefit of that in terms of cash flow, but we do not look at the environmental consequences. That is not factored in. So we carry on growing, and we're blind to the consequences of our decision. What happens if that reverts back to native as it will? I don't, I don't, I don't think we can go back there. We've introduced too many. We've got how what's that success rate in getting rid of pests and things? Why? Right. Even you've been sitting in the room today, you can see how hard it can be. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I mean, I don't like to happen to disagree with the, the war and plant situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, working as an archaeologist, those trees were not planted. I, you can go back on retro lens and see the aerial imagery. I mean, I can show you where the wild and pones data from. Oh, and many times the same, we get a native forest and DNA to seed lens and they've got all that in the bigger. Oh, I, I've been dealing with it for most of my life. But it, the grief it's caused this poor group of people, and it's an emotional thing, so is that. I mean, but I did the archaeological survey for up there, and there was very little use of that reserve until they decided to talk about taking the pine trees out. Mm. Mm. But you look at where you live, people the old fellas used to ride around the saddlebags and throw trees into the rocky ground yeah. box so they could get shot of a sheep. And how barbaric was that? So he wasn't been a part of the spread of wild end pines. And, you know, well, I, I understand all that. I just think we've got to have a different way of thinking and things. Oh, I agree. Mm. Um, Cheryl. So, yeah, sorry. Oh. Just, yeah, yeah. So what do you see in terms of the council? Well, how do you see that we can actually assess? Where, where do you think we should be going with this? Well, um, <coughs> there's an amazing amount of resource. I mean, this is a, a fantastic um, brief year. And we're all harping on about um, you know, renewables, but look where, where the level of renewable is compared to all the other things that we use for energy. I mean, we're up shit creek. <laughs> Um, and I mean, this is this is made to a T. Can we um, maybe bring Matt back for a workshop Monday so we get a really good understanding where we are in that level of our. No, just to answer your questions, that's a lot of material that I've been reading and resourcing, and these people are the ones that are doing the thinking about an alternative way. We aren't going to grow our way out of this. Can you forward me your presentation and I'll you've got it? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we get here. That'll get sent out to all councillors and we'll all go through it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I know you're extremely passionate about this and for very good reason. Thank you very much. And so a lot of our community. Oh, right? absolutely. And we've got to be you know, something we need a day on, half a day on. Righty ho, moving on. Ten Akwe David Tulich. Good to see you. Thank you, Ron and Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> I am Welsh, but I don't speak a word of it. Too many vowels. I don't speak a few. Fuck you, Yakamba. This is my language. Right. The floor is so, 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 members, thanks very much for this time. I'll just table that to you, sir. Just just by way of introduction, if you don't know me in the day, I was secretary of the um, Stromwell Historical Society. I served under three presidents. And the woman of, of this area between Cromwell and um, Middlemark stood in the head of lift, heavy lifting to get the rail trail underway. It took a lot of work and it took a lot of energy. And there was opposition, which was gradually whittled down and overcome. And my role as it is today is I, would, I just keep the paper flowing around you know, the leaders written. And interpreted what where they were at with, you know, who we who we needed to rock and a lever off to, and that's been basically been my life. My dad was the sole salaried member of the old vintage piece of county between the wars, <laughs> and our heritage goes way back to the whalers on in Kaikoura. So that this part part of where the passion comes from being a Kiwi, only a quarter cast Kiwi. Three of my grandparents were born in Great Britain. Uh, only, only two of them spoke English. Anyway, 
I'll whip through this because you've got a copy and it won't take up your valuable time. It's about the uh, basically about the heritage zone between Printers Bay and Old Cromwell Town and how that's going to look in hopefully three or four years time. Um, this submission seeks to enlarge a one made to the Cromwell Community Board two weeks ago. So it's a working process. It's a discussion document, basically. <clears throat> I was a member of the working group set up by the Cromwell Cultural Centre Trust three years ago. The group had never actually met. There's a copy there in the back. Subsequently, this demographic group, demographic group folded up. Oh, wait a minute. This role was taken over by another group of people who were proposing an event centre for the hall. Subsequently, this demographic group folded up also. There's no progress around that. Uh, the Bromwell Cultural Centre Trust had created an incorporated society was poised to work with the community and create a business plan for the new bill. This trust provided one of five representatives consulted over the makeup of the Hall and Museum. I'm a member of all five groups represented, um, including the Return Services Association. But I would like to say, with, in all respects, that I'm just speaking for myself, I'm not speaking with part on behalf of those organisations. But I am an active member of the return services and the location of the memorial, Royal Memorial is under discussion as we speak. And there are concerns from the members. Because of the foregoing facts about the Cultural Centre Trust, um, it could not be seen as representative or have a mandate from its members or from the community. So the representative, like myself, Today, it was only speaking for that one person, not for their group. They haven't had an AGM for three or four years. I appeal to the Ombudsman centres around the placing of a new museum somewhere along Mount Moore Terrace that encourages much more detailed consultation around all aspects of the Mount Moore Terrace build and rebuild. It would be really good for the Cromwell Museum to integrate its activities with Cromwell Heritage Precinct, which is already set up with copious amounts of public funding. The coming of the rail cycle trails is exciting. It will, it will make an integrated approach much more viable. We can expect much more international tourism in Cromwell, and it's essential that our heritage presentation maintains a high standard. At the end, I had um, contact with uh, Denise Singh, the daughter of the eminent scholar uh, Dr. James Singh, who has a focus. Well, we share the same focus basically, and getting things up and started is the hardest bit. Um, and having a vision as well, and, in, and involving as many people who are interested enough to come to a meeting or to a workshop. This year, the Chinese members of the Atari community have favoured the building of a replica of a Chinese merchant, Kangu and Wire and Co. That section of Mount Terrace was one time Cromwell's Chinatown, just between the Hall and the Victoria Hotel. Our Chinese community have a master plan stretching from Dunedin, Lawrence to Arrowtown. It is essential that Cromwell plays its part and keeps in step with this concept. Okay, that's very same as I did with Matt. That leaves you five minutes, so I'll give you a chance to wrap up with your, your highlighting points, please. I'd just like to say that the warm world, uh, shifting the warm world to the car park in front of the town and country is not a good idea, and, and there won't be enough space there for future commemorations. They'll be crowded there as it is, and to retain the warm world and to spread the planning out. Thank you. Thank you, David. The council has questions. No, all right. Thank you for travelling down from Cromwell. Great to see you and travel home stay. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Righty ho, moving ourselves back now. Do I need to move? We received those or anything? Why? No, thank you. Back to our um, agenda now. We move to page 22, which is submissions to the annual plan, and Saskia will be leading that paper. Welcome, Saskia and Susan.
Mm -hmm. Maybe that's most. Uh, just a couple of comments um, before we um, do any questions and um, open up the debate on this item. So, as you're all aware, the key consultation item was ISO 9 to find um, the, the roof on there. You'll see a summary of the responses in the paper as well as all the submission verbatim in the appendix. The Vipsa Community Board considers submissions on its topic on 19th of May and have made the recommendation to fund. You'll see that in recommendation C in the paper in front of you. There was only one other community board that had a submission relating to board activity that was in Cromwell. Uh, the Cromwell Community Board um, met on the 18th of May and had made a recommendation to the Council regarding the roaming program, which you'll see in recommendation D. Um, today, we ask that Council consider all the submissions, um, the written ones contained in the appendix, as well as the verbal ones that you've just heard and make um, decisions um, as you deem appropriate. Um, following that, um, Susan and I will finalise the annual plan to bring it back to your next meeting for adoption. Thank you very much. So councillors, the way I intend to run this, we structure this as firstly questions, just questions, not statements, not comments, but anything that you're unclear of in um, what we've got before us today in this paper. Then we're going to work our way through the individual items um, one by one, which will um, pretty much follow along the lines of the um, recommendation. So do we have questions on the paper first? Okay, so the first item I feel that we need to discuss is the ISIN line. Um, there's been quite a clear steer from the community there in terms of uh, how they view. Um, 111 wanted option one, which is a 0.76% rates increase for 20 years, fully funded. Um, the option of a 50-50 split was about 10, uh, significantly less, by uh, 22 as opposed to 111, fully grant funded 34 and don't support any funding 12. So we've got a clear steer from our community. Uh, that clear steer was followed by the board, but Tamer, I'll ask you to speak to that as the chair. Uh, yep, yeah, this is obviously something that has been on the table for quite some time. We've been aware of it. Um, I've certainly had members of the community who are involved in the ice skating rink to say it's been on their agenda for about the last 35 years. Um, certainly the steer from most submissions were just the arm of it. We really want this, we really need this. Um, this is going to bring a lot of benefit. Uh, we did have Dr Barry Wills come and talk to us uh, from the curling perspective and um, in the uh, tournaments and things that they're holding and just as we're all aware with the change of climate, the nature of um, having ice, especially most of you won't have to scrape your windows any time recently, mm -hmm. it's just going to get more and more challenging. Um, that certainly the BCB could see clearly from the submissions that the preference was to build this and build it now. Questions and comments on ice and line councillors? It's it's benefiting the whole district, isn't it? Just reading some of those comments, it's, it's beneficial to everybody, and it brings a lot of business to the town with the cooling situation. And they had worked really hard on it, and we did agree with Princeton Principal to fund that, mm -hmm. so that they could get their uh, fund, like the grant and fund. So I'm supportive of it. And just to clarify, because there was um, some concerns in a couple of the submissions, they have asked for 28 per cent of the total cost is what they're seeking from Council, and that was the fundraised from or received grants from other sources. Should it be district funded? <coughs> it, that's a much longer, wider conversation, Lindley, and there are some challenges, I think, around yeah. some of the grants already received if it were to be, that, be delayed longer. And if I should add to that, the reality is people who do come from outside the district are paying for the pleasure of playing on that ice through entrance fees, subs through clubs, and things like that. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we districtize the rates, comp, uh, <coughs> the grant component. That that sits with Alex, but the <clears throat> it's the user pay principle applies very strongly to those from outside of Alex um, and or outside of Vincent who are using the facility. Can I just add to that? 
the answer is, of course, it could be district funded, but unfortunately, we're not in a situation where that's able to be considered today because it's not been consulted on or, or worked through. So that could be something for another day. Well, it would be, um, we would be delaying for a year if we started that conversation. No, I can't yeah. yeah. <laughs> had to cancel a very big um, disco last weekend because of Mountain Lives. So just to be clear, there is not grant funding, it's understanding of only funding to over 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a one long look at this, I wondered why we're seeing a major project coming in outside of the LTP, but I, am I correct in the understanding that there are grants that will be lost if, if it isn't moved on? Yes. Any further discussion on ice and line, folks? No. I've just I mentioned at the DCB meeting as well. Thank you very much to all the people whose names I saw on the submission list who haven't previously submitted to Council. Hopefully we can continue them being interested in having a say. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, the um the next one is the consideration of um including Sam Flat Road in the road ceiling program. I thought it was on the road ceiling program, it's just not high enough up the road ceiling program for some people's liking, isn't that correct? Uh, yeah, I think so, and it's just a matter of we can prove that um in the program. So um so the, the, the recommendation came from the fact that actually the community board would like council to ensure that it makes sure that it's somewhere up front in that program. Does anyone have that information for so you can speak to that at the CCB. Ah, no, thank you. And, yeah. Exactly my with your thoughts around it is in the program, it just wasn't necessarily up. So in our roading program for ceiling, we have criteria, traffic movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so he felt that some of the information needed to be updated because they were seeing more traffic movement, um, which but, is why they. The program. Yes, Neil. Yep. The other factor here is that that don't forget that, that because of some recent consents um, that have resulted in some of the road being ceiling by a developer, um, the the issue has changed, and and the I think we have a situation now is that that why it needs to come up is you've got all but done. It doesn't make any sense. It's not good management to to and you have to revise what you've already had in your plan because of those changed circumstances. So that's what's really probably driving this more than anything else. And when you come off tar seal on the bread and vice versa, you just start chewing up the tar seal. Mm -hmm. My point is this though, if I read that recommendation, it's senseless because it's already on the road ceiling program. So it says that the recommendation is that we consider including Sand Black Road in this road ceiling program. It's already there. So it's a nonsensical recommendation, with all due respect, is it not? Might just do the challenge. Please, please. Just leave MQP now. He's saying it's not on the program. Thank you. Okay, that solves that problem I have. It will go on the road ceiling program and get its due position in that program. Thank you from the ether QP. It, it was on the roading program in 2005. Someone might have got confused. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good note in the in the in the summary of submissions, actually. I think yeah, it gives you a bit of the history. Thank you. All right. Um part E, increase the water supply operational budget. By such and such, yeah. we, we have a little choice in that. Um, we're, we're, we're managing that. I mean, there's no need to really discuss that. The other things I wanted to work our way through can be found at page 26, and just really for noting as much as anything. Um, the affordability of all of this and a very good submission that was backed up by Rachel Baxter. Sorry, not Rachel Baxter. Um, yeah. um, Bachelor, thank you from Presbyterian support today. Um, so we've already had an opportunity to discuss that through our questions, unless anybody wishes to speak further to it. And I'll just note at this stage that Council has been aware that this is the largest rate increase proposed at the moment that we've had in many years, but we're also flying in the face of the highest inflation the country's had in many years. We could have and did consider what cuts can we make because the bulk of our problems stem from things such as depreciation, insurance costs, and general inflationary pressures. So we can't make those go away, but 
will signal in the LTP next year that we will have to have a really hard discussion amongst ourselves and with the community that if those levels of increases are to be continued, which nobody wants, what is it we're going to do without? And that's going to be a tough decision for the community, but it needs, and I think this council needs to go forward with that to say, here's your options. Yeah. And it's going to be a discussion for then. I think doing it at an annual plan time is, is a risky and fraught thing. So it's a matter of putting our heads down, but very clearly next time um, in the long-term plan next year, there's going to be some tough conversations. And we've got the people to do it too. Correct. Council. Um, housing has been raised by a number of people, and that is, continually on our radar. Um, Plan Change 19 is in train. Um, I don't want to comment further much on that, um, given it's in front of our hearings panel at the moment. Um, other than the aim of it, in some regards, is to alleviate the housing shortage. Modern new multi-sport um, place, um, stadium, whatever, keeps coming back. Um, that is an LTP discussion, not an annual plan discussion, but you see what the LTP might be discussing next year. Consultation and communication, that included one from David George, who we've heard from today. A clip on a bridge for Alexandra is in the roading program um, to get cyclists across safely the Alexandra Bridge, I understand. Engagement with the business community, it was a fairly long um, submission from Business South, some of it. Uh, probably I didn't agree with them. We'll be having discussions with the CEO of Business South about it. We engage a lot with the business community, I think, and certainly in Atlanta, as our economic development manager, many a time back and I are in a car at seven in the morning getting out and many data breakfast. Stu's often there, TV at Business Group, um, Sally and I team on a regular basis along with staff. Uh, CoLab, generally there in Alexandra in the Cromwell Business Group, unfortunately, doesn't have business breakfasts anymore, which I think is great. So, and uh, Nick and I both sit on the board of business at the advisory group locally, so not sure what else we can do. Connecting more water supplies. Well, the water space is so full at the moment. <laughs> what more do we say? Uh, there's some district plan comments in there, some comments about the consent processing times, which we're very aware of and concerns about the RMA reforms, which have been on our radar for three or four years now, but are coming out of Wellington. Is there any of those topics that are on that list on page 26, if you're looking at them, that anybody wants to expand on further? No, is there anything I've missed amongst all this Cordero that anybody would like to raise? Or anything in my comments that anybody disagreed with? Okay, then on that basis, um, I think we can progress with somebody recommending uh, moving recommendations A, B, C, D, and E as found on page 22. Thank you, Martin. Second, Tamer. Any further discussion, councillors? Basis, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. Carried. Next on the agenda is and it flows on quite well, community outcomes and community ideas for the long-term plan next year, and that's found on page 41. And we've got Paula Pura. Paula, welcome. Yeah, I and Saskia is remaining with us. So first out, I need to pass on Christina's apologies. She has a picture of at home, which is called President. So I will um, speak on both of our behalf today. So, um, this report um, is leading into our long-term plan, and it's two prompts. So the first um, section is relating to our community outcomes, and the second section is the gathering of ideas from the community that we can feed into our thinking and building into the long-term plan. So we're wanting to get this underway so we can get good structure into our 2034 um, long-term plan. So the community outcomes that we have proposed in this report is were adopted in 2021. Um, they were developed through gathering sentiment that we have collected through the community, community engagement processes, and it was assessing people's community sentiment of what was important to them in relation to local authority activities. And so those community outcomes have been used in the asset management plans and processing strategies that have been developed over these last three years and feed into the 2021. Um, long-term plan development. So it's in our view that it would be sensible to, to run with those with this next 
<clears throat> three year long term plan um, process. Um, and then in that time, we'll be doing our distribution work, which will help to give some more up to date information so it's involved in the process. The second part of this report relates to a community engagement exercise we did alongside the annual plan submission process. And the goal of this was to start our conversations with the community earlier on in our long term plan um, thinking so that we could incorporate community thoughts into our development of what we wanted to see in our plan. So elected members have a chance to consider those things and staff can look at them and, and model them up alongside existing workloads to then prioritise when the time came to um, doing that crunching on figures and on work programs. So the um, ideas have been split into three categories. Um, and just want to say as a preface, when we put this up, this was um, run through Council Select's like, online platform. And the preemptive was to say that we recognise that times are tough right now for the community, um, but we just wanted this opportunity to get some ideas in the mix. And on that preface, people came back with, I've got some really um, tangible, realistic um, ideas that could be incorporated into, into our and some aspirational ones, which is also on which the highlight. Um, so we put them into three lots. Um, the first lot um, were things that we felt sat outside of the council's direct line of business. Um, we have in the staff comment section put in some ideas of how of these lead agencies that could assist in those ideas and some suggestions to how we could potentially help alongside or um, some issues that we could assist. The second section were um, 14 comments in there that related to things that actually did line up with the sort of work that we did or uh, we do or are programmed in. And so we've included comments about those. I think what is exciting is that suggestions that people are coming through, we did have to um, it's on our work program, so that's quite cool. And um, some of the work that we can do is educate our communities on what we are doing and what is in training um, so that they can be informed and be involved. So what we would like to be doing is going back to these, uh, we have an email address. Um, only, but we'll just go back to email address and say, hey, this is what's going on, and if they want to be involved with more information, we'll return to get them in that loop. The third section is the one that we'd really love to input on, particularly, um, because it's things that aren't necessarily part of our world, um, but we might want to consider them to be in the mix when we're looking at what we want to do in our long term plan. Phase and that would be sitting them alongside our existing unit programs and working out what goes from there. Um, so, if you could indulge with me just to work through these ones together. Mm -hmm. the, um, the first one is the climate and biodiversity um, plan suggestion. Um, so, currently, staff are involved at a regional level in doing some discussions around developing this, um, a biodiversity plan. Um, it is a lengthy process because it's a also um, relies on legislation that's coming in and things that are changing. So council has an op option that they could speed up this process. There would be the risk that we would lose that regional perspective. The solar um, or wind power technology set on council owned assets. Um, we do do that at an individual level when we're doing project basis. We're thinking of those things. That climate change is a real thing and, and we really want to be responsible on that space. Um, there is an option that we could develop a business case on um, some sustainability uh, modelling, um, and that would be an additional piece of work that we could do in terms of what they wanted it. Well, uh, it might be useful just to get comment after each individual one, and I think we'll bring ourselves back to, uh, to where we were. So the, I think that the climate and biodiversity plan, and hearing from Matt, everyone's mm -hmm. concerns there, but it's bigger than us. So yeah. tying it in with OIC at a regional level is the way to go with that. Okay. Yeah. And solar panels, the why not is the dollars and the, the workload that it's, yeah, what a councillor's thoughts. I mean, I brought that up in a, and actually, we've got lots of bits of land, and there's a lot of it going in, both commercially and in private enterprise. And I'm not sure I did bring it up who I was talking to at staff. How do we look at it? Um, two, two, two parts to this question. We've got big chunks of land, should we not be looking at offsetting our emissions or generating power in our own environment? One. Two. 
if there's going to be massive, no, this might be planted as much as anything, massive farms going in, and I think there will, there's no regulation around a lot of that stuff yet, or that I can see. And I know that in the farming industry, there's a big push in the agricultural part where A, big farms are going in, and farmers are now looking at putting big setups and offset the irrigation costs of generating power because I think you're getting 12 or 13 cents a unit back into the grid before you step three. So banks are lending money, you get a sustainable loan to actually look at offsetting your emissions trading. And I just feel there's going to be a race to do a lot of it before the regulations come on board. That's two. Probably three is how do we rate for that? Uh, maybe in the commercial aspect, where you could have, I don't know, $100 million solar system, and it's probably attached to a lease agreement on a farm, but you don't pick up the rateable value of the solar system. Like it's a, if Contact Energy have a dam, yeah, they'll pay a rate on the value of what the dam may be relative. So what do we do in the future? Because it could be a targeted rate. Energy could be a targeted rate. I don't know. But of course, if I lease the land or you lease the land and the energy company came in there as a part of the value, there's a tax of title, part of the tax value lift, or is it a new enterprise that we have a targeted rate on? Like you develop an irrigation farm or a dairy farm, the value of it goes up and just rate it. But that energy, and my concern, and I'm not anti anything that's renewable energy at all, is that you could be offsetting the carbon emissions in Australia the ones the energy companies that seem to be looking at are Australian owned for mining operations in our landscape. But actually, there's no real tangible rateable unit that goes to a rate bar who balance gets, but it's the same thing. So, as often the case, Stu, your thinking is light years ahead of where we are because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's everything's the same, right? But we're, we're here. And we start the work now. To oh, well, I'd like to catch up with me. I had a discussion with the staff. I don't know who it was though, about the exact thing. And I think really looking at that is something we need to chat. I know it's a long time, maybe for a financial part, but we need to be opening our mind to think of how the solar energy or the renewable energy space is going to go. So our um, so I'm yes in that process, but whatever is affordable and realistic for we to look at. Right, so so our recommendation says considers community community ideas and agrees on the action that should be taken. This one has further investigation required. That's the action, and who's yeah. going to do that? So what would happen from decisions today, um, or directions today, would be different for long term pay process because there needs to be a conversation around resourcing. Yep. Essentially, um, we'll take that direction if that's really on that one, and it goes into the LTP mix. And we'll need to come and tell you what that means for work programs. Wonderful. Thank you. So we want that one to continue. Tracy, you had your hand at the time. Yeah, um, biodiversity plan for Central Otago. What I would like, um, there is a phenomenal amount of work already being done in that space, um, and predominantly by the rural community in relation to their own land. Um, I would hope that we wouldn't be reinventing the wheel and that council has the ability to actually tap into some of that phenomenal work that um, has already been done in that space, mm -hmm. so that it's not a double up of yeah. getting the same result, um, but yeah, it, I guess a sharing of information. I think that um, makes sense, Tracy, because we haven't got a national policy statement on biodiversity yet. So if we head down the track of a lot of energy into a plane and then we have to do something different, we'll be doing exactly that. So that's the direction of the further investigation. Well, we can think about that. Yes, yeah. thank you. The next one um, is um, the Burial Park. Burial Park, thank you. And it's just not listed on your own hand side, so the hand side. So talk us through this, Paul. Um, so the obviously the, the, the person who's put this in is, has identified other places where it happens. Talking to our team, our soils and biomass, it's not for the same constitution, so it'd be quite a job to get plants established on our existing burial site. So there has been investigation work done on that. It could be done, but it will just be um, a lot of work. Significant. Linda, yeah, do you have any knowledge on this? I'm oh, just agreeing with the soils aren't natural burials here, and I'm just thinking the trust of organisation, what would be required to try and do that and bring in to get correct soil would be 
hard. So the sand just don't have the the bugs in it break through the breakdown. So do we let that one lie if I dare use that? Yes, you can. Thank you. Everyone speak through that? Yeah, too hard for us. Okay, the next one says quick win. I like that. Um, short term bad bugs. So I believe Council is reviewing the um, the writing Bible today in the, in the meeting. Now part of that writing Bible has a scheduled one, and so talking to Quentin Peniel, and um, they are hoping to review that scheduled one later this calendar year. So um, if Council want that to be included, we could include that into that review process. Okay. Yes, the the areas basically they've identified as outside that Cornwall library area. There's lots of things. Yeah. So we don't really need to do anything more. It's in track. Just to proceed as sure to proceed. Thank you. Um, more street lighting in Old Cromwell Town. That'd be a big one. You can see one million dollars plus. Yeah. We need to discuss it further. Over torch. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have to be blunt. Now it's worth thinking, Council. I don't want to be blunt towards the person who raised it. So yeah. they did raise it, but they probably raised it in the space of not realising a million dollars. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Yes. That's what I tell my wife when we walk home at night. And I actually go, somebody needs to do something about the street once around and then digs me in the ribs. Okay. Yeah, just hold her hand and say, lead the way, darling. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. I'll take that on case of the blind leading the blind. <laughs> well, so we're not going through the investigate. I think that the price tag's just too high mm -hmm. with the previous discussion we've got with um, what we've done. Um, more parking in town. And I, I look at this one and see that enforcement is the issue, um, that there's no work streams already in place that this relates to, and that there's further investigation. Why don't we have somebody going around with our current bylaw giving people tickets? That's part of, I believe, your um, the parking by that we're looking at. I'm um, yeah. working on that, um, and they could come to that. So just following on, going forward through the chair, of those on the voting by law uh, paper today, linking them with QP to look at how we then have address undertaking parking enforcement in the most strategic locations because we don't need parking enforcement everywhere seven days a week. Really, but there's some pinch points in looking at how we best utilise what we've got and the money that we've got in the current budget to do that enforcement. Excellent. So where it says um, any work streams or any process is latched to that should say yes. Yes, and I think we can quite clean up the computer in there as well. Right. So we don't need to progress that in the LTP. Yes. Yeah. And the reason why it's taken a bit of time is we've had to um, set up the IOS system to enable us to actually undertake that in the box. Well, we're not through yeah. or issuing apartment infringements, doing the reminders, and where that's not paid, following up through the Ministry of Justice for the lunch all of them. So we've now got that in place. So we're doing it. Um, a cable car from Clyde up to the Clyde car park up to the hill. There's no price estimate there, but it would be dizzy, wouldn't it? Mm. Yes, uh, for council's involvement in this, I mean, obviously it's it, it's not all on council land, and, and it's not something that was all council um, activity. But you know, it's linking uh, and. Use a, or a, a commercial area with a car park that we put in, and it could be a community initiative that council could support in time, like in a community led development project. It would take staff time. I wouldn't suggest it was a staff thing. Can yeah, they not walk? Um, it's a, yes, they totally can. It's a, just and to increase or encourage usage of that car parking area, and it is a steep incline. So it's, a, it's an option that um, people have seen where you are overseas. And it could be a real great draw card for Clyde. Chris and I will go to Farrah's on that statement. Yeah. Put it in. Does it get used much at all, that car park? Huh? It doesn't, get, doesn't get used a lot, but gee, the playground does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. They might have them down there a fair bit when they're walking past. I guess the wind is better, but the playground's been a real one. Yeah. There's the red flute in the playground, and it's a real one too. Yeah. I think I think that yeah. might just be a bit in the two hard basket, that one, and we can not. That's a cool idea. Very cool idea. And I think that's the silver the other way too. Yeah. They might just pop up crumblers all over the place. So it's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But um, um, the Bell McEwen Golf Club is a real steep hill and they have a, a rope on a, on a continued system and you just hold on to it and it helps you get up. Maybe that's the, oh, cool. the cheap alternative. But again, I think community-led uh, 
would be with more progress at this stage. Consistency around residential subdivision development in Cromwell. Um, talk us through that, Laura. So um, we have we've got some work in trying to do to look at our um, agendas and our museum. And it's just a timing and resourcing issue, and there's so much going on in that world. That's whether that needs to bump up the probably so we get um, people in extended just a bit. Neil, do you have any comment on that one? What lost him? Well, he's some snore, I'm he snoring. He may be um he may be otherwise engaged. Um, no, yeah. no, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to find the mute button, unmute button. Um, I think the problem is always going to be is that what some people think should be a condition of a consent and what should be the outcomes and what shouldn't be. And, um, you know, also the understanding of how the how, how a consenting process works and how you have conditions. Um, some developers, I think, probably deliver more than others, perhaps as well. Um, and so there's a lack of consistency there, but it still meets the rules and, and addresses the, the effects that, it's, that, that the application is required to address. Um, so it's just not as simple as sort of saying there's going to be a consistent decision making process unless the council issues some direction that says that um, no matter what the developer offers, here goes what we shall have. Which would then wind up in the environment court pretty quick, I'd imagine. Well, you could do, especially if some thought you're um, over over requiring what you had, and if it, if it doesn't go back to a to a deemed environmental effect or back to our objectives and policies, it may be hard to enforce. So, yeah, um, listen, I've got a lot of sympathy for people that 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 get frustrated by what happens, but um, it's it's called a lawful process, and um, the reforms will make it a whole lot better, I'm sure. He says, no. <laughs> I've never seen a speaker drip with um, yeah. All right, um, so really we're aware of it, but it came through in the master plan very clearly that the narrow streets are not loved, but there's a problem we've got. It's in many things is there, and I um, it, is, it, it is interesting. It is interesting that a lot of narrow streets existed, um, have existed for some time as well. If you're going to have a closer look, um, and it's um, quite ironic some of those things when you go and look at it and say, well, there's, there's already already narrow streets that have been there for 20, 30 years as well. Sometimes doesn't. It's not an excuse, but it is an observation. Yeah. Thank you. And this is for arts, culture, and heritage. All of this as well, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we do have, as is noted there, we do have community needs strategies on um, heritage and, and arts. Um, and we are going to be doing some work in the district visually space in the next calendar year, in this calendar year. So um, we hope you'll get a higher level community steer on some of those um, needs and desires from the community. And um, at the same time, we can be talking with those sectors and I'd be keen to talk to those sectors that they're interested in and we can see that back into council and um, see if there's an appetite for that. If we, if we were to do that, we would have to look at our community development work program and work out what the priority is, and if that's a priority, that, that would shift into the work program. I sit here today trying to think how long the museum strategy is taken and wonder if this is a bit of work in the same space that is going to take a lot of effort and a lot of distraction and whether we want to start down that path or not. I can add on to that. The community lead component um, The community sectors and they tell us we bring it in and we speak on your behalf. If you've got a community, you can push forward with that consent. So, would you favour that being progressed further in the LTP? Um, I think it probably should come after the district vision and we let the district vision give them yeah. information to inform it. And then, if there's a, we can see an, an appetite and a momentum building, and we can start informal conversations for that, getting it up to be well informed. So, we've got that live now. Yes, I think it's about keeping an eye on it for after district vision. Yeah. Council, is there any problem with that part of my thing? Cool, thank you. Um, and then a very similar one um, below that, same same pathway. Well, yes, it's sort of like it does reinforce the restructuring to council's community vision um, group, because it does take in all of those six of into one. And, and pretty much the same for um I'm the last one. The last one. Yeah. Okay, so by my reckoning here, the ones that we need to or well, we're kind of beginning to progress as as the first two and the others are not going forward, are they right? Or they're already partial. They're already they're already underway, yeah, not needing. So so specifically needing to come through the LPB of the first two. Yeah. 
Is there anything else on the other two sections that people wanted to bring up or had anything? Thank you. Good point. I didn't have anything in the others. I thought they were in their proper place and, and we're in training. They're not going to need to jump to I've just got a general question for Paula. With, um, you mentioned that you're going to respond to those people and give them some information. Is Has that been done and is it going, is it going, when is it going to be done by? Yes, so no, it hasn't yet because we wanted to make sure we've talked with Council and Community Boards first to get that information together. What we would like to do is put up a, a summary of all the ideas and the summary of feedback onto our Let's Talk platform because we want to A, celebrate the fact that people have some awesome ideas yeah. and we're involved, yeah. and B, also for them to learn what the council's doing and also for other um, people and agencies to see what's bubbling around because they actually might jump on them. So that's our idea sort of generically to make sure that's out and celebrated, but we won't do that until we've got a good summary of what's our feedback is our collective council feedback. Um, and then when people submit submitted their little post-it note, online post-it note, we have an email address so we'll try and pop back into those individual addresses at least. Yeah. I guess that just gives people the ability to know that they have been heard. Yes. Yes. We have so. really want that. And there could be some opportunities for them to talk further with some activity leads and some of these projects have been interested in it. Thank you. Thank you for the great work. Mm, I agree. So in terms of our recommendations, Paula and Saskia, we've got C considers the community ideas and agrees on the action that should be taken. Do we need to put in there that the first two are the ones that are going to be? Yes, I, um, if we could put a, a recommendation in there and then we can help us out, um, that is um, including those first two topics to be brought up for the development fee process. So if we say that ideas number 12 and 57 considers the community ideas and agrees that ideas 12 and 57 should be further progressed in our LTP discussions. Good right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is talking about? This, mm -hmm. That's the first drink of this wonderful water I've had. Tastes like water, too. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, rotary drink to the water. Thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, William. Clear. I cleaned my kettle this morning. I'll let you know. You're right. There we go. Let's walk on the dark side <laughs> again. Got that one. Yeah. 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 Um, Wayne's written that up, so she is. Um, the citizens' community ideas and agrees on the action that should be taken, being items 12 and 57 of uh, appendix one of the report, should be progressed in the long term plan. So, the long term plan. So, you're going to take the same way, we're going to take that out. No, I was just going to keep it and then just tap a little bit back on the end. Is it possible to put that up? It's just hard to yeah. think. Yeah. 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 We're going to say what they are so that when you're reading the minutes, you're not observing that for an appendix. Uh, yeah. yeah. We could do some simple words um, such as um, idea 57 around the solar panel and, mm. well, I've got around the whole thing that we're going to progress. Climate and biodiversity. I think um, I think we take on the action that should be taken up. It's yeah. so, and can go as well. Agrees. Item item twelve on biodiversity plan. Sorry, on climate and biodiversity plan. And um, item 57 on solar and wind power assessments. And it's pretty narrow, just, just on the council yeah, land. Where do we not try to change it in, in general? Then there's a discussion. So, Stu? 
Well, if you read that with your parts on council land, owned, council owned facilities, oh. do we make it as a more of a general look no, this at is the just, long term land? This is just to refer us back to the yeah. new yes. Well, that's cool. Everyone's called that? Yeah. Happy to want to remove it? Well, A, B, C, and D, actually. Beryl, you know yeah. Beautiful. Thomas asked us for the second. Ooh. Any further discussion? Yeah. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, Ted. That's really good to know here and exciting to progress those two ideas. And thank you to the members of the community who contributed. What we're going to do now with the agreement of councillors is move to item, I think this is right, 12356, because Julie Mueller and Philippa will be presenting that, but Julie's joining remotely, so she's sitting there ready to go. Um, so we'll grab her while we can, if that's okay with everybody. Nobody's arguing. Nope. Yeah, that's your paper, Nigel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <laughs> so we've got 33.5 and 6 minute compliance update and as we got Judy. Okay. Sorry. Okay. 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 So Judy. Right. Hi. Um, so Thanks. sorry, I can't be there today. Um, so I'll um take my report as read um and I will just um, a clarification that I wrote the report with Philippa's input where, rather than her as the author, so I'll take responsibility for what's in the report. Um, so what I've provided is um, an overview of the operating environment and the um, sort of overarching issues which are contributing to some of the issues that we've got um, occurring in the delivery of the three waters operations at the moment. And these have contributed to the, um, the abatement notices that we currently have from the regional council. Uh, what I would say is that council staff are working really closely with the regional council staff and I would say we have a, a really good um, dialogue going there and they are working actively working collaboratively with us um, on time frames for addressing these issues and we're keeping them updated regularly on where we're at. So where, where I started with this was I started to look at each of the sites and the abatement notices on the sites and the, um, identifying what work, what the issues were, what work has been done to date, um, what work is in progress and what will still need to be done. Um, as I worked through that, I started to see that there was some kind of common overarching issues that I think are um, important that we get our heads around and address in the first instance. Otherwise, we will have more um, occurrences of these problems happening. So I've summarised those under five headings in the report. Um, and I'll just talk through each one of those briefly. So the contract arrangements, you know, the, there's clearly been some issues with the delivery. Um, and but I, what I would say is that ultimately um, and legally, it is council's responsibility to ensure the performance expectations of the contract are met. And we need to be putting a more structured approach and resource into our management of the contract. Fulton Hogan are acknowledged that they are making needing to make changes on their end as well, and they are um, working actively on that. But um, I think we do need to clearly have more resource into more um, regular auditing of the sites and ensuring that the items that are required to be done under the lump sums under the contract are occurring. In terms of resourcing, as I've outlined in the report, there's been significant more work coming onto the team um, and it is our expectation that that's going to continue. There's no indications that the kind of additional workloads from increased um, from the legislation that's been coming through in the past three to four years is um, that's not going to ease off. We've got deadlines in the future around doing um, assessments for our communities on their water and sanitary services assessments. Um, we've just worked through a lot of work on water safety plans um, and then those things are all going to need to be reviewed every every couple of years as well. So it's it's work that's come on on top of what we what we did in the past. So what I've um, outlined in the report is um, some issues around um, resourcing. Um, we have made progress in the time allocation of my time to enable me to be more actively involved um, four days a week on um, moving things forward, certainly and th through until after the elections and we understand more clearly where the government is heading with um, the water reform programme. 
Um, we also have recruitment underway for um, several roles and um, I'm working with the um, finance team on an analysis and review of the budgets and the staff and costs to identify what the options are for funding of those roles and if necessary I will come back to council with another report if, if there's more funding required. At this point it's looking like we can accommodate that within the existing budgets that have been put in for three waters staffing. Um, the regulatory requirement and monitoring um, environment has changed significantly, as you'll be able to see in the report. Um, and, and the reality is that we need to be more proactive and agile in our response to that. Um, and once again, that largely comes down to resourcing needs. So um, those that'll get covered under the, once we've addressed the resourcing issues. In terms of operational funding, the, um, the large cost coming through there is the need to do sludge removal at a number of sites um, at the same time. So we don't really have all the information that I need in order to be able to give you um, a clear outline of what the costs are going to be for that going forward. We have a contract going out for tender. We expect um, to have numbers for that around August. Um, until we get that tender and we're not really going to have a clear understanding of what the current costs are for that sort of work and by then we should have a more refined estimate on what work is going to need to be done at Ranfurly. So um, I will bring another report back to council once we have more information around that. And look, in terms of forward work programming, um, a lot of the pieces of work that are large capital items, they're not urgent. They can be, um, we can work through that with the Otago Regional Council and program them into our long term plan. Um, we have got a lot of those things in the program that went up to the National Transition Unit. What I would say is we're clearly in a um, period of unprecedented uncertainty around who is going to be the funder and the um, you know, they have the responsibility for the delivery of three waters in the future. Um, so we've we've done outline programs for the National Transition Unit. We are continuing forward with the um, work on the business cases so that we would have robust information to hand over to the um, National Transition Unit when they took over on the 30th of June 2024. Um, in, the, in the interim, um, that information will be presented to Council in a report in September. As you'll see in the report, the estimated costs of some of the upgrades for those projects for wastewater is really significant. Um, and it would be, you know, it would be part of that long term plan pro planning process. So um, is there any questions? Now, how do you have a range of planning out the Ranfley treatment plant come the wetlands bottom product cost between Two twenty five and one point one million. That's nearly eight hundred thousand dollar difference to cleaning out a pond with a digger and putting in a truck. Dairy farmers do it every second month. How do we get across that such a range? Um, it's because it depends where we can um, store what we have to do with the sludge when we take it out, Stu. So it's could it could be stored on site and dried and then taken to um, a landfill. Um, in the future, so it's it could be at the 250 end of the range, or if it has to be disposed of straight to landfill, then that's when we get up around the $1 million range. So we are working through the options for that, um, and we'll be working with the Regional Council um, on a resource consent around what we can and can't do on the site itself. Um, and that's why I haven't put a report for decision up today, because we need more detail around that before anybody can make a decision. What has it cost up till now? Um, so most of our sites, um, so at Alexandra we do constant sludge removal because of the type of the plant that is. Most of the sites um, we do pond cleaning um, periodically and in the past you know, within the industry, that's been pretty sporadic. We had actually programmed in our long-term plan every five years to do um, a significant piece of work on pond emptying um, and we had expected that you know we would be able to phase those in each five year period. Um, what it's looking like now though is that there's quite a backlog and the reality is that the amount of sludge in the ponds does start to impact things like your effluent quality and that. So if we want to get um, closer to our effluent standards we need to bring a lot of that work forward than what we'd anticipated doing. 
Um, so once we get the tender in for that Roxburgh site, that'll give us a better understanding of what the cost will be there too. And there may be enough money within that budget even to contribute to the cost of this, this site. So that tender goes, goes out to the open market or is it just tender yep, with yes. this? No, it, it is, yeah. Oh, um, the $120,000 software package with funding from the NTU, is that amount of cost to that? Sorry, like Sorry, you just cut out there for a little bit. You, could you repeat that question? Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Ah, uh, no. Um, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, sort of. Okay. Um, so I didn't catch your whole question there. So what um what's happened there? What's happening there is that um right across New Zealand councils are putting in this software to be a, enable um the, the software will pick up the information and um, put it into the reporting that's required for Tamara ROI without and, and reduce the manual input that's required from our staff at the moment. It's going to take what we've been told is it'll be late in September before that's fully implemented. Um, so we because we charge for our time doing the RFIs and all the things we have to do for the National Transition Unit, we get income coming in and we can use that income to do things that um, offset that staff time. So a lot of councils will be employing extra staff from that money or they'll be um, bringing in consultants to help backfill their staff roles while they're working on the National Transition Unit work. So what we're doing is using it for the um, software because that actually frees up a 0.5 of a position for us. Does that make sense? And the cost of that software will be funded wholly from that NTU yes. funding received. Yeah. yeah, it does. And we've already budgeted for that and that funding. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Julie, you mentioned in the contract point fund, just to go back to that point. Um, is Fulton Hogan going to make those changes within the current contract? And is that going to be imminent those changes that you mentioned um yes so they are making some changes already but i think you know um there's there needs to be a change from both sides um they're recognizing they need to we need to be making sure that they are making those changes um, more more regularly and we need a more structured approach to our um our contract management and that's certainly already happening at our end um and they're getting that information flowing through to them now so they're getting more regular um notices to contractor from us um and 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 they're quite aware of that oversight's lifted we have um a person now doing um we are doing inspection regular inspections of all the sites too it's just we've got so much information coming in from some of that um it takes a bit of time too to collate all that and then put it into a usable format as well so that's where we're bringing yeah. in admin, admin support into the team to help with managing that and i think i think it'd be fair to say that because we thought there would be a transfer on July the 1st, 2024, the current contract was extended rather than a new tender document being prepared, which might have addressed some of the requirements of meeting the new legislation and the fire monitoring standards. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, OK, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Vinita. That's it. Um, I thought there's a, a really comp comprehensive report on what's a complicated situation and, and again, referencing uh, the water reform program, the, ch the changes in policy have been extremely difficult, I believe, for this organisation to cope with. And, and add to that, um, shortage of school staff in the sector, um, the uncertainty that's engendered within departments and, and the requirements of meeting new, new higher monitoring and compliance standards. Thanks for a challenging situation which this report outlines. So I think you can take comfort that there's now going to be monthly auditing 
um, and a much closer um, monitoring, of, monitoring of what is happening. So this report is uh, to be received. Do I remove your motion? Second. Daryl. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? All in favour? Thank you, Nigel. Um, we'll come back to the paper that we skipped, which is the Three Waters Better Off funding. Christine, you're with us. Is that real science? Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, to take the paper is read just a couple of very minor comments um, from me before we open it up for um, questions and debate. Uh, the key um, purposes of this paper is to um, decide on reallocation. The so government has announced that tranche two will no longer be happening because of the number of water entities and they can't raise the, the different five now. So we did have a project for Amy Grace for tranche two, um, and we've got um, staff are recommending that that 50,000 gets reallocated by council to the common sand building project, and we're told that we didn't quite have enough funding for that. And we also took the opportunity um, while putting up this paper to give you an update on where all the projects are at. We'll see that in the appendix. And what we propose to do is on the SharePoint site that um, Wayne sends out an email of the key updates is to um, update you via that. But if there's anything of um, concern, um, staff will, will bring a paper here on the, the guidance of the finance um, oversight group um, that made um, for council. Any questions? Of course, questions. I have one to ask you. Yep. The RDFI, RFID, whatever it is for the libraries, it says it's unlikely it'll make the, orig uh, the original date. What happens if it doesn't? Do we lose the money? But what's the what's the consequence yeah. of being late? That's a very good question. Are you reassessing the contract? Ah. Check. This will be the original time frame of according to the, the project that the activity managers developed up. So what um Nathan and the team are saying there, an original milestone there. But I will confirm that. I'm not sure the contract is the way I that's then therefore not a problem. One can yes, one can hate it. I'll I'll find out today in email answers for me. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? I'll move that. So Stuart moves A, B, C, and D and turns seconded it. Any further discussion? In that case, all those in favour, I against. That is carried. Thank you. Well, welcome, Anne. And uh, page 64, plan change 22, dark skies, and that's the lead of um, our. P and R portfolio is joined us by teams. The deputy lead Ian will take this over. Over to you, Ian. So we've got item 2357, then change 22 dark sky, and we've got Ann to present the paper. Thank you. Um, as councillors will be aware, um, in December, on the 14th of December, we um, presented a proposed plan change um, for the, uh, to bring in a new chapter into the district plan. Um, around dark skies. Um, part of that process, we were still in the process of um, consulting and engaging with Akaha, and um, that process has continued and it's now concluded. And we've been, um, the Akaha has provided on behalf of the Mana Whenua, Kata and Mana Whenua, um, some input into the introduction, which is, um, which is good. So, um, so that process is completed. Um, the cultural context has been added to the front. Um, it is fairly, we've kept it fairly concise and um, it's, as we've made a few adjustments to the uh, assessment matters in, in, in consultation with the case. So, so we've worked our way through that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge again the commitment of NASB Vision and um, the amount of work that they've done over a number of years to um, progress NASB becoming. Um, a IDA of International Dark Sky Association mm -hmm. Community. Um, Wayne, are you able to put that map up? Yeah. Please. 
just thought I'd show um, councillors the area that we're looking at. So the intention is that the chapter will apply, or it has the ability to apply um, anywhere in the district that is mapped as a dark skies precinct. The initial one will just be Naseby because that's where the work's done. So if we look on the... So um, effectively, if, when the, the work that Naseby Vision did with the IDA, was around um, two, two of our old pa uh, paper maps that we had, which we don't use anymore. We now use the GIS mapping. So we've taken that and picked up all of the um, residential, rural residential, and infilled um, some of the rural areas within that, um, those two mapped areas, and then provided a buffer of 200 metres on there. Um, the group, the Nosby Vision Group, are looking at it at the moment, so they seem reasonably happy with it. So initially, the um, the present rules will just apply to this area, but we do have the ability, um, should this progress to get through the, and become part of the district plan, to be able to apply that elsewhere in the district. So we've said this, the way we set it up, um, keeping it pretty simple. Um, yeah, I think um, I don't really have anything more to say. I think it's take questions. Any questions or discussion? No, I'll move your recommendation. All we'll second. All in favour? Aye. Thank you. That's quite an easy one, isn't it? I mean, yeah. And uh, echoing what you said, the, and the, the, the effort that's been put in the yeah, over yeah. a long period of time. It's really been and, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and their commitment and the amount of material that they provided us was just excellent. Yeah, mm -hmm. magnificent. Great. Thank you. Thank you um, just popping back to that last paper, um, Christina, what's your mind says we don't lose the funding at that time, so forget my question. Um, I think this is an appropriate time to uh, call lunch. We're five minutes early, but that's okay because it's a lot better work than the lunch rooms now. <laughs> and it's a lot less often, so we probably need that. So we'll come back at one o'clock with the Alexandria Airport. Don't wait. We're sick. Thank you for the morning today. Folks, we're good. One o'clock. See you then. <laughs>